a, a good place to start is the beginning. How did Cube come to be, and what were the original pains that you and your team were hoping to solve? Great question. So basically, Cube itself has started inside, I would say, another company. Because back in 2016, we actually started another company called Statsbot uh, together with our team. But uh, it was like analytics company, which lived inside of Slack. And basically, uh, over time, like w when we started, basically in 2016, we raised our first seed round. And over time, we realized that there is no actually really big story around it. And uh, over time, we realized that people started to basically look at the technology under the hood of Statsbot mostly, not uh, not like on like original solution and what the product was. And um, we started to think, what if like the technology itself is something that uh, basically um, is people want more. And uh, in 2019, we actually pivoted and open sourced it like, un like Statsbot engine and called it Cube. It's how we ended up is basically uh, the Cube itself. So yeah, it, it was pretty uh, like bumpy road and how we ended up with Cube. Let's talk about the technology, like what problems yeah. it's solving, how does it work? How does it relate to existing technology? All that good stuff. Yeah, great question. Uh, so, um, so we just updated our position because over the years we were figuring out what is exactly cube is. And right now I think we have a really clear answer to it. So in short, we call it headless BI. And, uh, so cube, uh, was built even before like this headless BI w was a thing, but right now, like, uh, I think more and more people started to talk about this one. Uh, so basically what we mean by headless BI is for, uh, I guess, base things. So first of all is data model. So Cube allows you to model the data, define your like business definitions, business intelligence definitions, like measures, dimensions. Um, so, and how you query this, uh, from the raw data. That's the, the first thing. Uh, second one is an access control. So on top of the data model, it allows you to frame how data can be accessed what users can access and what data. Uh, so it's basically role level security or role based security, uh, permission models, etc. Uh, third thing is cache and clear. So yeah, the, this is like quite hard problem for analytics in general. And, uh, we really organically landed on this one basically because our users ask it to have it. And, um, I would say fourth thing is an API layer. So cube provides all, uh, I would say, so we try to provide all possible APIs, uh, which are like requested by engineers. So it's right now rest API, GraphQL and SQL API. So those four things we think is basically constitute a headless BI. That's, that's interesting. Cause like, if you'd yeah. ask me, you know, what the definition of a headless BI is, it probably have a slightly different, uh, orientation on the question. I think those are terms and concepts that are in part like marketing terms too. So like, I think it's good for all of us to talk about like, what is it, you know, if we're going to call something that like, what, what really are we talking about? Some of the things you mentioned to me are very like in the space of like semantic layer or historically, right. That's like, um, kind of mapping an extra semantic to your data there's also this idea of like dimensional query right or abstraction so that's like data access layer related so if there's something called that we would call you know the data access layer it's like an abstraction somewhere in between you know people wanting to query the data and people and the database itself so it has extra semantics it has role-based access control like data access policy type stuff um and then 
sometimes there's other things in that layer that like aggregation awareness, right? That maybe you have multiple data sets that can serve the same query, but which one is the, the most effective data set to serve that query? And then I think those are all things to me are like semantic layer, data access layer, and then database proxy service, like some, some parallel to be drawn between like API gateway maybe in the API world and the analytics world. Like how do we bring some of the concept of the API gateway to the, um, to, to the analytics or database world? Um, what I call it SBI was like the ability to manage chart and dashboard as code. Right. And it's, I, I think that's like made, that's my myopic kind of vision of it. But I think that people want to manage their data sets and semantics so that there's an overlap there, you know, managing your data sets, your metrics, like kind of metrics layer type stuff, uh, your, you know, fancy labels, fancy description, um, encode, and maybe a DBT models, right. Or maybe like an, there's an interface that's like you overload your DBT models, uh, or you annotate your, your, your airflow DAGs, you know, with some of that stuff and it gets, you know, synced to the database and synced to the BI tools. Uh, but then for me, I'm like, oh, you know, headless BI, if you remove the head from the BI tool, what's left, I guess it's like semantics, chart definition, dashboard definition, um, role-based access control type stuff. So it's all, it's yeah. all very, yeah, really entangled up, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and in essence, it's quite new term. And I, I think there is like a lot of like definitions around there, what it should be. Um, I guess we spend some time like thinking about it and the line of the head, like in this headless terms, uh, from our perspective lies in the like visualization. So, and then in that sense, everything visualization related uh, is in, not on the Q plate and it's how we basically draw this line. So, and everything like besides it and what uh, like classical BI did in the past and it's basically headless BI stuff. It's how, how we see it. That's interesting. I guess it's, it does make sense. If you think about the BI tool uh, or like head, the terms, the term headless, maybe just to establish it a little bit, I think. Um, so headless software is like software without a GUI or software that yeah, can be yeah. used without. So headless Linux is like Linux in terminal mode, I guess. Right. So yeah. then BI in terminal mode or BI without a GUI, I guess you can take out the visualization, you know, cause you're like, well, if I don't have a head that, or that I don't have a GUI, then, you know, visualization is off the table for us. We think, you know, when we say headless BI, you know, I, with superset and and that preset, I think we think about, you know, semantically defined chart definition or the chart definition as code. So you could kind of still define a chart, but maybe we could, you know, have a GUI to, you know, interact with it. Um, so really, I wanted to take a tangent. Uh, I heard the keyword GraphQL before. And like one thing, one thing in the past that I've noticed is like the GraphQL specification doesn't really serve the analytics kind of use case, right? It's, it's hard to express like a group by in GraphQL. I'm not even sure if it's possible from the GraphQL. Maybe I'm, I'm looking at like your grandfather's GraphQL definition. Maybe GraphQL has evolved in ways, but to me, like anal analytical workloads were not in scope for GraphQL. And yeah, so, great. so in what way does Cube, you know, use GraphQL then? Or is that, is that true too? Like, I don't know. Yeah, and so so and it's why for like we a long time we were really reluctant to introduce GraphQL in the cube. So and then basically uh, the specification itself is one reason is it, it is really not well suited for analytic queries, and for another reason, so the protocol itself is not well suited for analytical queries, especially for long running queries. So. But it actually, like GraphQL API was so demanded that it was contributed by community. Like, uh, so it was one of the biggest community contributions to Cube. And it seems people really wanted, like really demand for having single uh, access layer to data, like all TP and all app uh, brings much more benefit than uh, all of this, uh, uh, basically downsides of GraphQL in analytics. You know, the usage pattern there is it that people want to, want to use, um, cube for OLTP type workload, like kind of key value access. They want records or is it used for, um, reporting? You know, one thing is like big reporting. You want to see like all the invoices for the month of, you know, 
I think we, yeah, we used to call it operational reporting. That yeah, for, mostly for um, all up workloads. So it's for analytical queries. And usually, um, uh, so uh, GraphQL used in application, for example, people have like bigger application and analytic uh, features is just part of it. On a single page, you can see all TP queries uh, along with all app queries. And it's well, where GraphQL is very like beneficial to have it in one graph, one big GraphQL query, which is aggregated by a gateway and basically split among services, like in a microservice architecture. Oh, aggregated by gateway, what does that mean? So does that mean that, so there's no semantic for aggregation in GraphQL, or I'm not sure if that's a true statement or not, but like, is there a way to do a group by, and to express in GraphQL? And if not, what's the API, API gateway uh, aggregation? Uh, it's more like aggregation in terms of, so there is a proxy, uh, which uh, splits your GraphQL query in the multiple parts, which served by different servers. So one, for example, can be served by Hasura and another part will be served by Cube. So it, 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 it's how, uh, it's okay. usually well, it's, Yeah. So I think it's more like the terms like federated, not federated. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think that's, yeah. I don't know. I know that was the prom, one of the promises of GraphQL. So I don't want to go too deep in GraphQL, but yeah, I yeah. Think one of the promises was like a single window into like multiple application and federation, like, you know, defederated queries. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious to, to zoom in more there, Pavel. I mean, where, where does cube really fit into the actual modern data stacks? I think we've danced around some of the ideas, but how would a team actually implement it? Like it kind of sounds like it's, it's, it's middleware to some degree. It's kind of this layer. Where does that layer really sit? Uh, how should people who are, uh, maybe used to having their database talk directly to a BI tool, uh, think about, think about where cube sits and fits in. Yeah. Uh, uh, really, really great question. So, um, so we, uh, actually started, uh, more in the space of embedded analytics, like historically, because it was a, like a sweet spot and still is, I guess, whenever you need to build in uh, analytic features into your application and get the native feeling of your application. Uh, like, uh, basically <laughs> you want to have like charts and, uh, other, uh, like rendering components to basically be like, uh, coded as a part of your application. It's where like cube really shines. So it was, uh, like where we landed when we initially open sourced cube. But over time we realized actually people want to like use cube for internal use cases as well. And the reason for it is especially this data model and access control, because by introduction of this metrics layer or so what you can have as a benefit. So for example, you have embedded analytics app. So, and uh, you already defined your business domain and set like what people ask based on that, can we use the same data model for our internal analytics? Because essentially the data is the same, definition is the same. Uh, and uh, like uh, benefit is how this data model can be used across all like rendering engines that they have. And why is BI uh, wanted to be used? Because they don't want to uh, basically code any visualizations for internal anal analytics ad hoc analytics themselves, because they can justify this cost for embedded analytics, but not for internal use cases. So it, it's how it fits the like modern data right. stack. Yeah. So I think like the use case you're talking about is data apps, right? So I'm building a data app yeah. custom, right? I'm building an application, maybe it has some OLTP, like it has, but it's just like building a modern application and there's like an interactive analytics component to it. So I want to bring data into my app. So then I would use, we'll use cube as the data access layer of some kind. So I don't have to like install a database driver and like, maybe there's like some semantics that are useful and shared there. Then when you talk about internal to, I think you're talking about internal data apps. So there's just like external facing data apps, internal facing data apps. People are building all sorts of custom data apps nowadays, which is awesome. And something we definitely want to enable. I think like, I, I think like, Interactive analytics desperately want to come out of BI tools, you know, and like embedded analytics is just one vector for that. But I think we like analytics and context are so much more valuable than 
analytics in a cage, uh, i.e. in a BI tool that, you know, it wants to come out. Um, so the internal use case, I'm curious too, if there's the use case of the kind of database proxy, right? Maybe I have like five BI tools and then I don't yep. want to define my data access policy in five different places. Yeah. Um, so that's more as a database proxy. Maybe it looks like I'm connecting to a database, but I'm connecting to cube and cube, you know, wires the query. Maybe there's a little bit of translation. Maybe it's a little bit more like NC SQL agnostic. It translates, it brings back the query. And it might, you know, return good error message saying, like, hey, I actually don't have access to, you know, this data set, or I'm going to apply a rule level security filter for you. It's the same across all BI tools, all interfaces. You know? Yeah, th th that's exactly how we landed on this problem. It's basically uh, while people were building their embedded analytics solution, they realized, oh, I have a cube and I actually can decouple my like data definitions from actual data source. And it's basically, you can have, like, define your stable uh, business definitions and uh, actual, like, underlying data sources right now is not coupled to business definitions, like data definitions. And in that way, people started to realize, so they there is a decoupling in place and they can have multiple data sources if they want. But actually, most of the time, it's single data source, which is cloud data or house. Uh, we have uh, cases where people are migrating uh, like their cloud data or houses from one to another without changing like front facing side, which is like beneficial because cost of configuring BI is high as well. So it's something we see uh, like people start started to leverage and it was like quite organic pull from like the problem we landed. So then I think this part, so now we're talking like, it sounds a lot like, you know, metalware uh, and there's no like bad connotation when I say, I think metalware is yeah. fantastic, it's a good thing. There's a lot of reason why we need, you know, abstractions all the way down, but knowing this, so then the query language for cube, like do, do you have a CQL, like some sort of like cube QL that is like a little bit more universal and knows how to speak different SQL dialects. And there's a whole can of worms there too, of like trying to like, a common denominator, you know, transpiling is very difficult. And yeah. So uh, actually this is really like really, really great question, uh, which we are still figuring out. So when we started to think about like this API for, uh, BIs at that point, there were already contributions like from open source who, uh, for example, contributed Metabase and they used internal, I would say analytical query representations to pass to uh, cube and cube on, on the rest API level, uh, we use uh, uh, really a lab query language, which is in many ways similar to MD it's uh, like, uh, and uh, in fact, so, uh, but m most of like BI tools, they speak on the SQL. And that came as a, like the biggest challenge. Uh, so what we decided to do is we decided uh, just to implement um, really one of dialects. So right now, uh, supported dialects is MySQL, but we are considering also to support Postgres. And uh, so I did. So it's from or to, or so people write, so let's call something like dimensional queries or something like yeah. that. Like, you know, like, do you have your, and by the way, we need, I think we, we need a universal, like dimensional yeah. language, uh, query language. Maybe that's an extension of GraphQL. Maybe that's like reviving MDX, which we should take that tangent. So MDX, like for people not familiar is called, is multidimensional expression. It's a OLAP um, counterpart to SQL. So it's like SQL for analytics and it's, yeah, maybe to try to qualify it. It's like aware of dimension. It's aware of hierarchies. It's a query, like it will do things like cross joins, do like uh, matrix type joins. I forgot what else is in MDX. Pretty, pretty cool language. Uh, I encourage people, especially like if you have a, maybe you're not academic, but you're kind of curious about like what uh, the previous generation of data folks, you know, worked on and they went pretty deep in that area. I think they were more advanced than we are nowadays. It's like, you with the generational generational shift, we forget some of the the what was discovered in previous eras. You know, it's like the story of innovation. Yeah. It's, it's it's pretty interesting. But yeah, so to go back, so I'm rolling back now, and we can pull on that thread later. 
uh, but like pulling back. So we, we, there's dimension. So is it, I, I give cube a dimensional query and it translates to MySQL, or it's more like I write in MySQL and it knows how to talk, speak different dialects, like speaking Presto and Druid or like different things. Yeah. Like it's more like you're writing, um, uh, the MySQL query, like, okay. uh, or Postgres query and, uh, like cube tries to coerce it to analytic query. So in fact, um, like if you think a little bit about it, the SQL to a lab query is not kind of solvable problem because it's ambiguous, uh, in many ways. Uh, but if you think about, um, the, uh, this transition from a lab query, which is generated by BI and converted to SQL and then converted back to basically a lab query again, this problem can be solved. However, there is no like straightforward way ways to solve it. And right now, I guess we, we invest a lot in this one. We, as a first implementation with you guys, uh, with super set. So it was, uh, like pretty, like straightforward, a lot of heuristics mm -hmm. done to basically to recognize what query, what all, uh, analytic queries, uh, requested by this SQL. So to basically infer it from, um, from yeah. SQL generated by superset. Yes. It's like, you know, so there's like, if we think of it, like all the things you can do with SQL or right? the corpus yeah. is pretty big. There's like, you can do pretty much anything. It's very complicated. You can have like correlated subqueries and all this like nonsense. I mean, it's not nonsense, but uh, you can do all sorts of things. And then the SQL that C that superset and BI tools are likely to generate is a pretty small subset of SQL. Like ours is, is like data set centric, right? It's, it's always like, you know, on a, on a single, uh, most of the yeah. time on a, on a single table. It's also like just primitives are like group by and filter and then time grain type stuff, you know, a little bit of time zone stuff on the, on the time, but all that stuff is a pretty small subset that you can translate to all dialects. Yeah. And, and we started to think about, um, like actually, uh, building query engine because someone in the conversation asked us, oh, that's. Uh, like query engine in a cube and uh, why it doesn't understand this query. And, uh, we basically answered, yeah, there's, there's actually no query engine right now, but we started to think, why don't we like actually have a query engine and we, uh, right now is an ongoing research and the uh, idea is here, we can introduce, uh, basically real query engine. It's based on data fusion, uh, Apache arrow data fusion. So it's basically, um, uh, query engine on top of L. Yeah. So how yeah. does that relate to CalSite? Cause to me, I, I would have thought you guys would use CalSite, you know, cause so CalSite is like, what is it? It's, it's like, you know, a, a, a toolkit to help, you know, databases learn SQL. I don't know if it's the right way. It knows how to do like that. Um, as it called again, it's like query grammar or decomposing yeah. a query into phases and like stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, in when in many ways it's very similar. However, call side it's more like on a SQL processing side, and uh, data fusion is more on a data processing, uh, really it's like a, uh, physical processing. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's closer to Presto maybe in that nature. It knows how to create a plan and execute a plan. Yeah, but it's more like a library rather than actual query engine. Uh, so and. It, basically you stand under the hood of cube store, which is cache and clear of cube. And we just, uh, uh, thought, why don't we use it for cube SQL as well? Because, um, uh, so what is actually people want on the end of the day, they want to evaluate SQL. So yeah, it's I'll something we are. Yeah. I'll take uh, a quick, a quick, note. give a pointer. There's this really great talk by Julien Le Dem. I, I think it was a data council like three, three years ago, or maybe like pre pandemics. It's been a while, yeah. but uh, his talk was about decomposing the modern database or something like that. And he was saying that basically more and more, we have like all the bits and pieces to like reassemble a database with things like parquet and arrow as like, you know, surdies or like file formats and things. And then you have a call site. That's like a, processing engine, you have things like now fusion, I didn't know about, um, so that, you know, assembling a new modern database is becoming easier. And then, you know, people are using bits and pieces to create different flavors of databases, which is pretty cool. And then the fact that we took the SQL parsing engine out 
in something like CallSite, then that means like even like a, a database proxy or middleware can use that and transpile SQL into other SQL. Yeah. Which is like, I think it's cool. Some of it, like, oh, what's the right la layer to solve these problem, right? Is it in the database itself? Is it some sort of like database proxy, like uh, close to like an API gateway type abstraction? Or is it in, you know, a universal semantic layer type thing? Uh, or is it in the BI tool, right? Really, the, the, you know, it makes sense to do some of that in the BI tool too. So it's like, ah, oh, you know, where does it belong now that we're de Now we used to have like these big, big platform that did everything. Now we're delaminating the stack into a bunch of smaller things. You know, what belongs where is still an intricate question. Yeah, and to circle back to what the, the, the framing and the problem that Cube is hoping to solve, I mean, this... It looks like the heart one, one big challenge that I think organizations have is you spend so much time just trying to define uh, your data models, the source of truth, um, and you basically instead of if you're going to do all that investment, it's it's better to kind of do it once, so to speak, uh, and then just and then make sure that it's you know it's it's going to be easier to maintain and uh, and it's going to work. Y'all's aspiration is that it's going to work with every tool that you care about. But I wonder, is how is isn't that what a metric layer is? Like, I'm curious how you guys think about the fra uh, how uh, cubes framing around headless BIs is, is different from what a lot of people are now talking about when it comes to the metrics layer. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that that's a great question. And uh, again, as though those terms are like really new, so and uh, uh, like I guess you you can have. Uh, you can find a lot of definitions out there, but our perspective on it is uh, so headless BI is a little bit more broad in a sense that uh, metrics layer uh, basically is more about data model and access control uh, and would unlikely to have uh, like serving parts like APIs and, uh, and the caching and um, Oh, like on that side. However, again, so there can be like many definitions out there, and then and it, yeah, <laughs> I want to yeah, give yeah. my definition to after, yeah. you know. Yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah. but, but in, in, yeah, in in many ways, it uh, I, I guess it it's pretty the same. Like what is called headless behind metric layer, um, like in, in very simplistic definitions. But again, so we ended up splitting with this a little bit. Uh, and um, for example, I guess, uh, so this data model, for example, or metrics definitions can come from different sources from upstream tools to Cube. Uh, we just recently released integration with DBT where like Cube can read uh, basically metric definitions from DBT. So that can be uh, like a great example of it. So we see it more like uh, Cube will still be a little bit more upstream, upstack. So not, not upstream, sorry, upstack, uh, like to like this metrics definitions. Yeah. So you, you don't, you so don't really great. care if people define, like you're not kind of requiring that people use the Cube specification to define these metrics. You're, you're happy to have that live somewhere else. You really want to kind of kick ass at the serving part of the problem. Yeah, I guess we are focusing like serving uh, part a lot because like caching clear and also access controls and like dynamic part of schemas where you can manage it and scale. Uh, basically, uh, so Cube is designed to be like really high performant. And right now we are something like of like hundreds, like from hundreds to thousands of queries per second, which can be served by a Cube cluster and we we want to push it even further. So, and like really high performance and also we are considering like real time um, as a uh, basically, which will be part of a cube, like part of which a cube can solve. So yeah, and uh, with regards to like matrix layer definition, so it it is more about how people want to actually maintain their matrix layer. It can be really like DBT definitions or else we are considering other tra like transform tools or it can be YAML and we want to support all of this stuff. So basically to read from all of the sources. 
Cool. Yeah, I've got so much to say. I think like, there's a few prompts I'm gonna list out. One is naming things, you know, and defining things. Uh, and, and then I'd like to talk about like the, you know, the database proxy or API gateway and like all of the things that can be done on that layer. And then which ones, I, I, I think it's inspiring to think about what are all the other things, like if you own that layer, or if you're in that position and receiving queries and transpiling them, bringing results like what you can do there. Um, and then, yeah, getting into like the metrics layer itself. The, fir the first thing is like naming things and defining them. It's like you have two uh, found, like, you know, engineers, but also like founders. And there's the risk of like letting the market, you know, or, you know, if the market is like, oh, you know, metrics layer resonate, therefore we're going to start calling things that. And then we'll put whatever in there that you think is relevant and, you know, drives conversation forward. And that's mm -hmm. just not the right hat to wear, I think, when wearing things, so, uh, when, when naming things. So. I think like I think it's our responsibility as you know practitioners to be like okay let's make sure we are primarily kind of like technology focused when we name and define things. Uh, yeah, even with that, I still I still don't know what you know. The yeah, I was just gonna ask. So then, how, how how would you think about metric slayer versus headless BI? You know. Yeah. Uh, well, so say just metric slayer. I think like the things that are not well defined for me now maybe that's good to point to instead of trying to define it but one is that is that a data transformation engine or is that a semantic layer right and it or or both or um you know i think there's a question of like well maybe it's just semantics all the way down right like you, you declare your transformation even in dbt like you just say like uh you know i'm just going to define my transformation but i will not you know say what needs to be materialized or not materialized uh like the, i will let the database kind of define that but i think right now there's there's one thing you you didn't maybe um highlight which is like kind of the, the challenges around governance too so i think there's extra semantics so the metrics layer is you know a mix of semantic layer and transformation layer type stuff and uh, but with maybe more more constraints and guarantees around governance, like who owns it, who created the thing, where does it come from? And it kind of understands itself. It understands, you know, maybe slightly more advanced, higher level abstractions that are not SQL. They're like like higher level abstraction and your SQL primitive. Um, and then there's a real question is like, is that what people want? I think it's like kind of a big company, like mature data engineer problem. The market, I think, Practitioners right now are saying like DBT works for me because I know SQL and SQL is simple and everyone knows SQL uh, with a little bit of templating, you know, and simple DAG management, it works very well for us. And you start getting into, you know, high level, co like complicated semantics, you lose a bunch of people along the way too. Uh, but yeah, so that does not, I mean, I think that does not define the metrics layer. And like what I've done is like, oh, wait, is that a semantic layer? Is that a transform layer? It's a little bit of a boat with some governance kind of constraint um, you know, is, is what I see. And then, you know, where does that belong for me? I do think that it makes a lot of sense to to bring the trend, the semantic layer, semant semantics inside the transformation layer as much as possible. So you don't have like a complex transformation layer and a complex semantic layer. Yeah. Um, I would rather just like put it all in one this, place. I mean, this is why DBT is building a, a metrics layer so that they can, yeah. so it's just kind of defined in one place, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can kind of just add it, on, like pat it on top, you know, and say like, uh, if when you get there in your maturity curve, you can kind of add that layer on top. But, you know, one, one thing that people didn't like, I think in, in the past or so the, the, the whole analytics chain is so fragile. And if you have like a very comp, a lot of complexity in all the layers and they're like, on top of that, you got to have a really complex semantic layer and the change management with all these things, uh, uh it gets like really, really hard. So for me, I could, right now we, we like the data set centric approach, you know, to say like, oh, the contract between people querying the data and the people making the data set is like simple tabular data set as opposed to very complex schemas. Yeah, that agree. And, to, and, to read. and and it, it seems uh, like like the space is really hot, and a lot of stuff is going on. And uh, we try to be not opinionated on this like part of things. And basically, our perspective on it it end up with 
all the spectrum of solutions. So someone will be modeling like in DBT, someone probably want to model it in Cube itself uh, or other mm -hmm. like uh, ELT tool or even like define their own YAML format like to like define this metrics layer. So I guess we will see like a lot of uh, solutions like all the spectrum eventually. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it's something we are trying just not to be opinionated and provide uh, as much integration as possible here. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? I, I think it does make sense if someone is like, hey, I'm really invested into Looker and like LookML makes a lot of sense for us. And we like to put things, you know, our schemas are very settled. We're very mature. We don't change very quickly. Like we, our data schema don't evolve quickly. So you know, that works a lot for us. We understand it. We want to put the complexity there. Someone else is like, hey, we move really fast. We live in DBT. We live in Airflow. Like we want for all the complexity and the, uh, and, and the semantics to live in that one place. And, you know, someone else might be like, hey, you know, we wrote something custom or, right? And it's like, there's no bad use cases. Maybe it's all reasonable. So make it possible everywhere. See the patterns emerge. Uh, maybe there's a variety of, of patterns. So there's, there's no best practice necessarily. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I yeah, think, I mean, uh, thing, like, you know, we've lost, you know, it's like the this idea <laughs> of like aggregate awareness, right? Or like being, and you know, you mentioned cat, or I'm not sure if you mentioned caching, you you you, you talked, you hit on like cube performance earlier, yeah. like talking about QP, QPS and stuff like that. So where's the magic there? Do you guys like store and cache data sets, query results, uh, you know, how, how does that work? How do you accelerate? And that performance thing is really interesting. If you have a middleware, performance and caching can be, you know, a thing that middleware can do well. Yeah, we do. And, uh, and it's actually, uh uh it's it's it is the place where we invested a lot like historically uh like as any like engineer who starts working on analytics uh we, we were like really bullish on like making everything like not cached why why we even need it but like when we shipped like the very first version of a cube uh, we realized like immediately that there is no way it can work without cash. And we started invest, uh, first of all, in, uh, in memory cash, uh, and it's still there. We have like a memory cash and eventually we ended up with something called like variations. It's basically materialized tables, roll up tables, which can be, um, used to serve like specific queries. Um, it's, uh, it's a cube implementation of aggregate awareness. Um, as okay. in many ways, similar to what Vertica does. So, um, projections. yeah, and projections. Um, so you can define your pre aggregations, what data you want to pre aggregate and cube will take care of, uh, like basically refreshing this stuff, um, uh, and, uh, making sure it's up to date and choosing the right, uh, pre aggregation in at the query time to like serve a uh, user query. So yeah. It's in the same database. So let's say if I'm using BigQuery, and I don't know, like if you for a wide variety of engines or not, but like if you do, so let's say I use BigQuery, I put cube against it, it would create roll lap table. So also the term roll lap is relational online and analytical processing. It's an old term, but it's this idea that um, I guess you're serving dimensional queries off of a database. <laughs> there's a cube yeah. abstraction and it is, uh, you know, and there's maybe multiple aggregations that are, uh, multiple physical representation of the data serving the same queries or variety of queries. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, when I refer to a roll up, there is uh, another one definition like roll up table, which is, which is uh, same by pronouncing, but, uh, it is R O L U P, which is rolling up, uh, <laughs> Like oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah roll, up. roll up, yeah. So, and it's basically, uh, yeah. Th th these tables are used when uh, you want to uh, store only top level aggregation without like uh, any, uh, I would say, lower level dimensions, which is usually done for performance reasons. So, and yeah, like back back to a question. So. We initially started as a, um, like 
this pre-aggregation engine like is an in database pre-aggregation engine. So we created these tables inside of like data warehouses. Uh, but then we realized actually that uh, most of data warehouses are not capable at serving really high concurrent traffic. And uh, if you're um, familiar with that problem, many data warehouses. Are you, are you thinking about ship? Are you thinking about Redshift when you say that, or are you uh, generalizing? Because like, I think Snowflake and BigQuery don't necessarily have problems with that because they serve concurrent queries from all of us all the time. Right? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're truly by tenant. Awesome. Yeah, but I know other uh, Redshift. B BigQuery is most performant in that sense. So it allows you 100 concurrent queries if you run a pay as you go account, and which is really a lot for, I would say, B2B analytics. But if you, for example, hit like B2C con like concurrency problem, 100 concurrent queries is too low. And uh, yeah. we have. Yeah, like if you have like data apps with yeah, a lot yeah. of, well, let's say GitHub as a. Yeah. You know, our representation is like slice and dice around. So there would be like millions of people on there running all sorts of queries. You know, yeah. That hammer quite a bit. So th those basically were designed to, uh, like data warehouse, we were designed for internal use case in mind where concurrency is not that, uh, is not an issue. Yeah. So over time we realized uh, when we started to onboard more and more users, which is, which is really scalable use cases, we realized that the rollup tables and cache itself should be external to these data warehouses in, or, in order to be like high concurrent, scalable, and really uh, low latency. Because for example, again, most of data warehouses introduce significant latency for query. And it's usually you'll see like uh, for big queries, usually at least 800 milliseconds and like second and one and a half. Uh, at yeah, and then too, so they have like yeah. multiple tiers. I think everyone is kind of after that too. And there are data warehouse technologies nowadays too that are, you know, in memory, high concurrency. Like if you think of the premises for Druid, Pino, ClickHouse, uh, and Firebolt, yeah. I think it's like they want to, well, so it's sometimes it's like they, the way that they manage concurrency is by going sub second, right? So if you, if you used to have a hundred, like maybe a thousand query per minute, and then you bring it in memory to be able, like Druid solves essentially um, concurrency by uh, by limit, by making the query so fast that there's no concurrency anymore, right? You can just sequence them and they'll be fast enough almost. Yeah, agree. So it's, uh, I guess it's ongoing thing, which many DB vendors are trying to solve. Uh, in fact, it means it is actually, uh, and it's why it's BI engine was introduced and it's not part of BigQuery. It, it is usually some other technology, caching technology, which should be introduced on top of your, of your cloud data house because like technology itself is not designed to like to be cache. And uh, like cache and clear in cube um, arise quite organically. And we envision it at the end of the day that, um, that basically because of right now, modern BIs have it, uh, like most of modern BIs have this caching player and it should be also a part of headless BI. Yeah, to, to me, it does feel like it's external to the BI problem. If you think about like data consumption, data visualization, it's like databases in much better place to solve that problem because they know, well, it's not yeah. just database too, but it's like, if you know about lineage, right? Like so say dbd you know knows about lineage somewhat it's it's kind of it might not really know it doesn't really parse the sql and know what's going on but in theory it has everything it needs to know to know about lineage so if you know about lineage then you know what's effectively a materialized view of something else too and you know what's the best you know table to answer your question so transform layer knows certain things the database also know may know a lot of things um, I do think like Dremio, for instance, is very aware of the transformation and the derivation and everything is a material is, is a view in Dremio too. So I can know these things. I'm curious, like what you guys use for, cause you had to pick an engine for your accelerated yeah. tier, right? For your caching. So like, I'm sure you picked something in memory, something really fast. Uh, but how did you go about picking a thing or do you support multiple things and how does it work to refresh all this stuff too? Like. You know, one of the toughest problem in uh, computer science is to yeah. So uh, manage. yeah, th th this this is really a tough problem, and uh, we were exploring uh, 
a lot and uh, and a lot of different technologies to to approach it and uh, like the first version, really, we were using Postgres and MySQL to store the stuff because, like, like variation tables were small, and uh, and we just started doing the stuff to see if people really want to use it. And it's turned out over like over time that it doesn't really scale, and we realized that people want really like large scale cache, like. Uh, caching which spans like really billions of rows like in the cache and there is really no technology on the market which is kind of like a caching technology that can fit it in memory or somewhere like in a, like in a fast access. So we ended up designing our own like caching technology which is under the hood as columnar storage again based on data fusion query engine. You guys are building a database. That, you guys have you built know, your own in, database. In some way. <laughs> yeah, it's and, a slippery it, slope. I, I don't. I mean, I know people are interested in building databases. That have people are like, let's just build a database, right? That can't be so hard. Just have to figure out how to update it and make it in memory. Well, I guess like it does relate to the comment earlier. Of, like it's easier to assemble a database nowadays with Fusion, with Calcite, yeah. with you know. Yeah. So the the. Uh, um, it, it is in some ways a database. However, um, we we didn't implement all the uh, like SQL um, basically set of queries which is possible. Really small subset, less than five percent, which are only specific to roll, roll up tables. So we don't imp implement a lot of the stuff which uh, which are usual like data warehouses do, but we do a really small subset of queries very well, and we we've done it uh, for really specific purpose of serving call up tables. So it's how we work around this problems of building like full fledged database. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of questions there that I have. Like one is like you know, usage base aggregation. I think like something like a frontier of OLAP, like fast queries is for having a database that learns the usage pattern of a certain data set. Then based on the usage pattern, figures out which cache to maintain. Like, you know, it's like multi-dimensional cache, like which aggregation am I going to store? Uh, but then, you know, the, the Vertica approach was, uh, you know, Vertica, like reflection in Dremio's projection in Vertica is, you have like the data engineer will specify very clearly like which physical represent of the data should be maintained, you know, and the database then figures out how to maintain, you know, rematerialize, recompute what it needs to compute, you know, the right way. Um, so like, yeah, how do you get, there's, sometimes there's a suggestion engine. So like Vertica will tell you like, here's like some really bad suggestion and how you should build your projection <laughs> based on what we think. It's like, like guys, you need to work on your projection. <laughs> suggestion <laughs> engine is not really great. Yeah, so this is a uh, like really, really deep problem. And uh, actually, uh, so th th this problem was introduced pretty the same time when cu cubes were introduced. Uh, this problem is called data cube lattice. Um, yeah, and if you Google it, we have a blog post around it. Uh, and it turned out to be uh, at that time in a top 500 most cited uh, computer science articles about beta cube lattice problem. This problem is about what if you have multiple tables and if you try to materialize all the permutations, like all possible permutations of metrics you can derive from these tables, uh, what is gonna cost you and what is optimal way of doing that? So, and this article points out that that is actually an NP problem. So it's really hard to solve. Uh, I mean, unsolvable usually. <laughs> so, and I, yeah. and uh, we spent some time re researching this stuff as well. So idea is, um, and it, and that's why basically back to your point, uh, we, we hear a lot that the basis should solve this aggregating problem. And it's really tough because of uh, when you land on this problem at a database level, you don't have a context of like what is queried which is metric metric slayer does. So the context is essential. So you should know what is gonna be queried because uh, when you define metric slayer, it's just like 1% of what will be 
queried out of all the permutations, like from the pack tables actually in place. So it's usually like, yeah, uh, it like some data set or some, some workloads might be very deterministic, you know, and finite. And then, but like the whole premise of OLAP is like, you don't know what the queries are going to be and people are exploring. And, you know, the moment you have an answer, you're going to ask the next, next question. So I think like we, we know that, but we know that it's a solved problem though, understanding, uh, you know, what's the corpus of queries that gets to this database. I know um, Microsoft server, Microsoft SQL server analysis services, as, you know, usage-based aggregation thing. And, and also an algorithm that would show you a little graph of like, you know, of all the possible permutation, I'm going to compute, you know, the 20% the more likely, you know, which ones I'm going to store. And you have like, okay, if you compute this much more, you're going to serve this much more query efficiently. And then there, at some point, you just kind of ran out of, or you get to diminishing returns, like story more aggregations, you know, there's more aggregation than data at some point too, yeah. right? So it gets, uh, it doesn't help yeah. at some point. So to start to wrap things up, since we're, and we just have a few minutes left. Um, <laughs> and so I think the natural next question I have is, what is the future of, of Cube? Like what, what are the kind of outstanding problems that, you're finding in the community and and uh, in this problem space that uh, you you think that Cube can uh, play a big role in in tackling. Like what what's kind of left for for you guys to solve? Yeah, what what right now uh, like organically unfolds for us is basically this SQL API, uh, and uh, we are grateful for launch with a uh, with a superset, and this was like really really successful. And we saw that like a lot of people really want to connect their SQL tools to Cube. Uh, we received like mails like uh, from different parts of the world, uh, basically basically begging us for connect Excel to Cube. And we, <laughs> we don't know why people want to do it, but <laughs> it's not that there's a single person asking for it, like like dozens of people asking for connect connecting Excel. So this is our uh, next endeavor, basically connect uh, as much SQL uh, consumers as possible, uh, basically data tools, and make this integration uh, like really shine with all of the tools. Very cool. Yeah, one thing I said I, I might mention, you know, to, to wrap up on an opening uh, statement uh, is like trying to list out all the opportunities in the database proxy or like call it database middleware or what, whatever it is. Like, I think like cube is hitting on a number of them. I think probably the most, like some of the most important, but there's a few more I can think about. One is like stuff like, I mean, caching is a huge one and performance acceleration, stuff like that. I think data access policy is a huge one. Uh, a new one that I hear more about is cost management. So we have like infinitely infinite scale data warehouse now, but we don't have infinite budgets. <laughs> Uh, so it will take on any scale that you want it to take, but uh, at some point your budget is limited. So budget management of like how much you as an analyst or your team, you know, what's their budget and try to limit that. Um, I think there's there's much more there like around like rate limited quality of service um, that also relates to performance. And you can just imagine like uh, tying your data access policy to your budget. So like certain teams and people have, only certain budget that they specify in cube like that would be yeah like cost is it's just never part of the discussion for these type of tools so i think that would be really interesting yeah and then another one is like more semantics and statistics so like databases are kind of uneven uneven as to how they manage statistics so really often you know bi tools or people querying the data want to see a histogram of it or a nice data profile of what's in the table or things like NLP, right? So if you wanted to do, uh, I was talking to like two cool found, uh, founder from a, a YC uh, company recently, they're called Cogram and they're building, you know, an NLP, like natural English. Like I'm gonna ask a question in English to my data and it will translate the SQL and then give me results. Uh, but I think like there's a lot of semantics that are required to enable that. Um, so those semantics and statistics could be hosted too by, by that middleware and served by that middleware consistently too. 
So more yeah, more we, stuff to have. There's like people, listeners, do, do you have um, probably comments? I'm not sure if we have a place for comments on the podcast, but other things like listing out all the things that, you know, API gateway for databases might be able to serve too. I think there's, there's lots of fun stuff there. Awesome. Exciting stuff. So thanks again for, for your time, Pavel. And um, yeah, I hope, hope both of you have a good rest of the day. Yeah. Thank, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks.